we're really excited to have this collaboration between Johnson Johnson Innovative Medicine, um, formerly known as Janssen, and uh, Bristol Myers, um, because what we have here are two companies that have extremely deep expertise in developing anticoagulants and running cardiovascular outcomes trials um, with the brands Zarelto and Eliquis between the two of us. And so uh, we've got this great depth of expertise uh, and we've got a, a great commitment, uh, both companies to patients with cardiovascular disease. And this is where we have the opportunity to really transform the treatment of cardiovascular disease. Uh, and, and that's very exciting, I think, for both companies and couldn't find a better partner to do it. And, and just to add that uh, the, the alliance, the partnership is really um, a joint development. Um, and so we actually take a very active role, both teams, uh, in making all the strategic discussion uh, decisions about the program. Uh, and this has started happening right, right from the outset. So um, from phase two, where uh, Janssen ran the TKR, uh, total knee replacement study, phase two study, BMS ran the phase two acute stroke study, to now the whole uh, Librexia program. So... Uh, the, the experience uh, that uh, both sides have, and, and just to personalize it, I at Bristol Myers Square, I had led the clinical program for Apixaban. And similarly, the Janssen team has uh, a, a, a whole lot of bench strength of people who were involved in a multiple Zerolta trials. So it's, it's great to have that experience right up front, which allows us to uh, execute the Librexia program, which we really think is a massive program and why it's unrivaled is because 50,000 patients in three phase three studies run simultaneously, concurrently, it's unheard of. So it's been a great partnership, not just between the two partners, but also with the academia, um, that is uh, the academic research organizations that are playing a very significant role in the program. Yeah, Mil Milvexian um, shows the promise through its phase two studies of having effective anticoagulation as good or better than anything we have today with a much better bleeding profile. And um, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about why we think that. And then, uh, Dr. Mohan, you can jump in too, certainly at any time. Um, one of the things that we have to remember is all of the agents that we have to fight life-threatening blood clots um, have bleeding hand in hand with efficacy. This is antiplatelet agents, this is anticoagulants, even fantastic drugs like Xarelto and Eliquis. As you go up on the dose and get more efficacy, you go up on the dose, you also get more bleeding. Um, factor 11 is different. Um, there's genetic data to indicate it's different. People who lack factor 11 don't have a tendency to bleed. They have hemophilia C, but they don't have a lot of spontaneous bleeding. Um, there's genetics that indicate that they have people who lack factor 11 have less of a clotting tendency for pathological clots and people with more factor 11 have more of a tendency to have pathological clots. And so there's a lot of evidence to indicate that factor 11 is a factor that can really sit at a point that differentiates <clears throat> pathological clots, clots that expand and cause disease and problems from hemostasis, which is clots that prevent you from leaking blood out of your blood vessels. And so we, we've, of course, done lots of preclinical work that also indicates that this is the case if you inhibit factor 11. And we've done phase two studies in, in both total knee replacement, which is, a, which is a venous type of a clotting situation, which also is low flow state, it's similar to atrial fibrillation. And in secondary stroke prevention, which is an arterial type clot, which would represent strokes and heart attacks. And in both cases, we can see efficacy across the doses with anticoagulation and a very flat bleeding curve, unlike anything we've ever seen before. So we're very excited about this. Uh, we're very excited about how it can go after the three indications we're currently studying. Um, and I think that, um, you know, the other thing that we're very excited about, and I think it's a big differentiator here for us, 
is that through those phase two studies, one of which was conducted by each company, so that again talks to this great relationship we have between the two companies. Um, we really understand the dose response relationship and we understand that the, the best dose to take forward in venous type clots and atrial fibrillation is a much higher dose than the best dose to take forward in arterial indications where you also have antiplatelet agents being used. So that's where you'll see in our phase three program, we have 100 milligrams twice a day in atrial fibrillation, and we have 25 milligrams twice a day, one quarter of the dose, which we think is the optimal dose in secondary stroke prevention and acute coronary syndrome. But Puneet, hand it yeah, over to you. Yeah, sure. Um, and I'll just build on what uh, Dr. Lich just said. Um, so one of the unique things about this factor 11 inhibition is that the model really came, as Dr. Liss mentioned, from a real world observation, an epidemiology sort of obso uh, epidemiologic observation of patients with hemophilia C uh, who have a deficiency of factor 11. And the following of, of this cohort for, for decades basically showed that while they did not have spontaneous bleeding, they did have lower cardiovascular events and especially strokes. So it's a, it's a great exercise in what something that was observed in nature and then moving through that, our clinical, our preclinical colleagues developing molecules and antibodies to actually mimic a real world thing, a biology and, and producing a, a drug, an agent out of it. And um, irrespective of, you know, um, which way you inhibit factor 11, whether you do it by an antibody or you do it by an oral drug or an injectable drug, the, the, the data is very consistent uh, that for the first time, what we see is that for increasing efficacy, we are not paying a price in terms of bleeding. And what we mean by that is that, as Dr. Lister already mentioned, it, it, this has been traditional teaching that uh, you increase the dose, you can get more efficacy, but you're gonna pay the price in terms of bleeding. And, and that's why uh, even fantastic drugs like Eliquis and Zerolto uh, have limitations. Uh, for example, not used in acute coronary syndrome, never tested in acute stroke, uh, high areas of unmet medical need. And which is why we think that this factor 11 inhibitor can go into that space because you can gain efficacy without that fear of serious or significant bleeds. And the phase two data up till now um, consistently is showing that trend. So that's why we are very excited about going to phase three. Yeah, and so so building on that, as, as he mentioned, as, as Dr. Mohan mentioned, we've, we've got people who get strokes and people who get heart attacks. There's good evidence that anticoagulation can help them, but it's not used currently because of the fact that you get bleeding with current anticoagulants on top of antiplatelet agents. So that's, those are wide open spaces that are very important spaces. We're talking about the number one and two killers in the world, in every region of the world, heart attacks and strokes. And then on top of that, uh, in atrial fibrillation, we, we know that a very large percentage of patients, something like 40%, are either undertreated or not treated at all for their atrial fibrillation. Um, with anticoagulants because of concern around bleeding. And so you have all of these patients out there, millions of patients at risk for strokes because the, the concerns around bleeding of anticoagulants. So those people all need something. And the people who currently are treated, they're treated, they've got the best standard of care we've got, but wouldn't it be great to have something where they didn't have to worry so much about bleeding? So, you know, we're talking about changing the face of medicine here. The overall goal is to confirm the observations that we've had in phase two, and uh, we hope to see a very positive, very obviously positive benefit risk uh, in our three phase three trials in these three indications, atrial fibrillation, acute coronary disease, uh, acute coronary syndrome, and in secondary stroke prevention. And if you look across those three, um, you know, our goal is to transform how the biggest killers on earth are treated. So it's, it's, a, it's a rare opportunity um, in a drug developer's career to have something that could have such a, such a wide reach, millions of patients. 
Yeah, exactly. So what we're doing here is is truly building from what was done with DOAX out there is they were a major development. Remember from Warfarin to going up uh, to a Pixaban and a Roxaban and a Doxaban, um, especially in the field of atri- uh, indication of atrial fibrillation. But now we're going beyond that because uh, we, as, as was mentioned, there's still the fear of bleeding is the first thing in the minds of our physicians and our, and our patients. And that is actually leading to substantial number of patients who are either not given anticoagulation at all or act, or are treated with lower doses inappropriately. Uh, so we think that factor 11 uh, inhibitors are, are going to, as I mentioned before, going to now separate this, 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 this come up with this new paradigm that you could actually block the harmful clots uh, while preserving hemostasis, which means the ability of body to, to stop bleeding, to heal itself uh, in case you need that. Um, and uh, and I say we are expanding on that. So that was already mentioned about atrial fibrillation. But again, as I mentioned previously, going into acute coronary syndrome, going into acute stroke, two populations where we know that anticoagulants are probably much more effective than antiplatelets, which is the standard regimen today. But the reason they're not used is this fear of bleeding. And we just feel that um, drugs like milvexin are going to open a whole new world out there where physicians then don't have to choose which one to use and what does to use uh, and all of that, uh, where we think that we are doing a very nice separation in our clinical trials to pick the right dose for the right patient population. So, so we feel strongly that this is going to change our clinical practice in the future substantially.